Um, next, we'll go into IPA and kind of how it's evolved. So last time when we got together, I showed you this. <laughs> um, this was almost exactly a year ago. And this was where IPA was. Um, we had seen Daisy Disk, which is a, um, basically shows you all your, your files on your hard drive and what's taking up the space. Um, and this is called a multi-level pie chart, which is a really long name. So we just call them tree peas. Because somewhere call, they called it a tree pie, like a pie chart, but a tree pie chart. So we just call them tree peas. And so we had kind of mocked up a few things and sketched up some ideas of how you could show what's going on with Wi-Fi using this. Um, so last time our house field day, we were about at this stage. We were almost going beta. I think we were about ready to do private beta. Um, so we took the concept of the tree pea and put it in here. And we have a couple different ones. Uh, the rings are, this is your um, BSS ID, and then your clients, your frame type, and your subframe type. And it's all color coded. Um, I, we've switched the colors around quite a bit since then. But the green here is showing your data rates for um, for fast and slow on different greens. And then blue is data packets. Uh, red was probably management, and purple is control. Um, so we're trying to group what's going on. You know, if, if you capture all the packets, you know what we're showing. And it's, it's evolved a lot since then, but I want to kind of show where we were at last time we talked. Um, so we took that idea, and this was about, about March. So this was actually a released version. Um, as you can see, it's a little more polished. We have tooltips, so you can mouse over, and it'll show you what the data rate is. This is showing you the average data rate of all of those packets, um, how many bytes that is, how much time it took, how many clients are on this uh, BSS ID, and more information about it. Um, the associated data table is showing for the entire entire tree pea. So this is showing you your SSIDs, how much time, total clients, everything. And then we have um, the timeline. So you can, just like you can on channel you can adjust the times. Um, so it, it's getting more polished. Then we had this. <laughs> <laughs> so we realized that you know we're developing software that's specific to Wi-Fi, and we're diving really deep in, into Wi-Fi, and we don't know enough. Um, so we talked Keith into coming up doing a training for us. So Keith came into our office, did a two-day um, all-hands-on-deck training. I think the only thing that we did in those two days besides listen to Keith was ship some Wi-Fi out. Um, but we all sat around, and Keith talked to us for two days about really the, the innards of Wi-Fi. Um, and in that, Going back to here, he's like, this is great, but see all this purple stuff? All that's just beacons. I don't care about the beacons. So you're, you're swamping your tree peas by just showing me these beacons that I don't care about. I, I wish I could just get rid of that and see, see the relevant data. That's about right, right? Hmm? OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we took that, and we added, added the filters in, which allows you to do that. And we've cleaned up the UI, um, done quite a bit of work. Um, over the last year on IPA, trying to figure out what's a really good way to help you visually see what's going on at the Wi-Fi. Just like channelizers for your spectrum and kind of what's going on at layer one, we want IPA to be a really good layer two tool to you know, help you diagnose issues you have with your network, um, your network settings. And I think IPA should help a lot more with optimizing your network settings versus channelizer that's really good at tracking down the interference and, and troubleshooting. So Trent is going to go in and demo all of the Cool new features in IPA since the last time we talked. All right. Well, we uh, we really wanted to focus on the usability and <laughs> helping people understand packet analysis and why it's important for uh, people entering wireless. And so the fir the first slide, uh, which is you know, meant for people that open it up the first time and they're not sure exactly what they're, they're going to see. We've, we've implemented several kind of introductions on how to actually use the tool. And then the next, next screen over, this is where you kind of start your analysis. And IPA is designed to kind of uh, take any PCAP file that you can uh, gather, whether it's from an access point, whether it's from your Mac, whether it's from an Air PCAP adapter or something else, we want you to be able to look at it in the most appropriate way for troubleshooting wireless. Yes? 
So funnily enough, I like this so much, I actually tried to use it with a wired capture and discovered it didn't uh, load. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that's, that's actually fairly common with some of our users it, because they like it a lot and they want to they visualize it in the same way. However, the, the requirements for some of the things that we do in this tool, we have to have the data rate, we have to have um, the radio tap or 802.11 common headers. Mm -hmm. So if those are stripped out, which sometimes if you export something from OmniPeak into a PCAP file, it'll strip out all the good stuff, which is what we are using to visualize wireless information. So, uh, yes? Um, and one thing, it seems like a lot of the tools that are out there um, evolved from the wired side, and then they're adding on some capabilities for wireless. And sometimes that works okay, but you can still tell the core it's a wired tool. And with IPA, we wanted to basically just focus on the Wi-Fi side. Wi-Fi has its own distinct issues. Um, like, like Keith talked about in our training, I mean, you sort of shove layer two, three, and four all together into one layer, because you almost have to on the wireless side. And that brings in a lot of different issues than you would have on the wired side. And so with IPA, we're like, we're going to focus strictly on the, the Wi-Fi stuff. Once you get to an actual data packet going across the wire, then you know you have a decent link, and you can go to other tools that do that. But for right now, we've really focused just on the Wi-Fi stuff. And so with a wired PCAP, I mean, it doesn't have control frames, it doesn't have management frames, right. none of that stuff. So. <coughs> OK. So uh, you can actually plug in an Air PCAP USB adapter now. So if any of you have uh, one of the Air PCAP NXs or Air PCAP Classics, you can plug it in and do a live capture straight from the application. So right now I'm capturing on channel uh, channel one, which uh, the Air PCAP is capable of doing channel bonding and two spatial streams. So uh, it's not the most modern. Uh, you guys had questions for the Wild Packets guys about uh, you know how capable of it is. But remember, for those of you who want to capture the faster data rates, just create a PCAP file in your Mac or whatever you're using, and you can open that up in IPA pretty easily. Any, any plans to rebrand an Air PCAP mm -hmm. card um, through MetaGeek or, and or combine it with the Wi-Fi product in a single card? Um, we resell the Air PCAP NX. Uh, we've been working with back when they were cased. I mean, we've known those guys since 2006 or so. Um, and we're looking at other options for cheaper options for capture. Um, you can actually open Netmon files in here. And so we've looked at some of the other adapters that might be able to work with Netmon. One issue we have with that right now is we can't. You have to use the Netmon application to change the channel and set the channel. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do to get around that? Some of those things. So we're trying to figure out cheaper, better options um, going forward. Partially because the AirPeakUp NX is only two by two spatial stream anyway, right. so it's already outdated. And I don't think they have any big plans to go forward as far as as, far as we can tell. Cool. So to, to start off, because I, I know some of you haven't, haven't seen this before in this type of presentation, uh, these are the multi-layered pie charts. So in the middle, uh, actually, let's start off with the table. Right, right up here, we have um, details about the, uh, the entire capture. So this is where you'll get the list of the, the total number of SSIDs and the total number of clients detected and the, the overall retransmission rate for the entire capture. So what, what kind of retransmission rates were we seeing in the entire capture? And then down below, this is where things will get a little bit more interesting to you because we can uh, look at each BSSID. So when I, when I highlight one of these rows, it's going to highlight the slice as it appears in total bytes sent and also in the total amount of airtime used or in the total amount of packets transmitted, okay? And all of these have different um, meanings, or you can use each of these to accomplish different things, looking at things differently. The packets is really useful in seeing the ratio between data and ACK, or looking at your RTS, CTS. Though th that's what this kind of multi-layered multi pie chart is. The airtime is really going to bring out the legacy data rates. So when things are transmitting at one megabit per second, so I'll bring that one into the forefront here. We see a lot of purple, and that's due to the management frames. So rewind a little bit. Colors, purple, management frames, orange, control frames, blue, data frames. Okay, And we'll go in from the center, access point, to the clients that are connected to that particular BSSID, and then subframe type, which is going to be your data, blue, orange, control, 
and purple management, and then outward is going to be the subframe type. Okay, so in the airtime, in the airtime multilayered pie chart, we see a lot of purple, and that's because, well, I'm not going to tell you because I'm actually going to show you. If I if I hover over one of these things, it'll actually show me the minimum data rate that it's transmitting at. So we have a lot of slow talking uh, transmitters or uh, packets being sent at one megabits per second. So that's someone that is talking a lot slower than someone that is, in this example here, I look at this Apple device that had a effective data rate of 40.7 <coughs> megabits per second. He sent a lot of bytes, but in the, the total amount of airtime is going to be a small amount because he was more efficient at getting the job done than one megabit per second. Any questions about that? What is that number, 40.7? So obviously that's not a data, right? <coughs> Right, right. So this is this is the average, okay? It's the average, and we also call it the effective data rate because this is what the data rate will appear to the user. Right. Uh, so we are we are taking out um, all the 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 dead airspace that they experience. So all of the inner frame and airtime that was in between all of those data packets. So it's closer to a throughput. Yeah, it's closer yeah. to like throughput. Yeah. We wanted, we wanted to go with that a little bit more than uh, just an overall average because that's going to represent something that a customer or someone looking at the report generated by this might say, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. Any questions about that? Yes? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. So... Uh, I don't have an example of that specifically, but uh, we'll notice in the airtime um, there's a big slice of orange, which is control frames, and some of you will immediately go, "Wait a second, control frames are short." Uh, these are CTS, the act. So acts going to be taking a lot of airtime, but because uh, sometimes they'll reserve uh, airspace, uh, we are actually. Uh, Calculating in the short inner frame space, um, the PLCP header per uh, phi type, and we're also um, calculating in the diffs for anything that is not a control frame. So we're adding that into the airtime, uh, and we'll take kind of the average amount uh, if we don't know it, and we'll apply it there. So this is as close as we can get because we're not going to hear every single frame. If you remember, air, uh, when you make a capture, you are basically listening to a range around you. So you're not going to hear every single device uh, talking to that particular wireless network. If you're sitting right underneath the access point, you'll have a better view of what that access point hears. If you are sitting next to the client, you'll hear uh, a better view of what that client's contention domain is, is like. So this is going to give you a very good client perspective view of what is happening on the channel that they are operating on. Hey, yes. So one of the things that came up yesterday we were talking with um, while packets was uh, the ability uh, to actually capture data off some of the APs from different vendors. Like I know Cisco and Aruba are right. people mm -hmm. do that with their APs, and I think uh, Aerohide does it as well. Would you be able to take a packet capture off one of those APs and feed that into this to get a more AP centric view? Not currently. I think that'd be great. Um, so, like an RP cap, mm -hmm. kind of remote well, PCAP. Right. You're saying just grab the PCAP file off, or yeah. you want to do remote capture? Uh, just we can just, we can just load the PCAP file. Yeah. I think that's what it is to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it works. Yeah. I mean, it would be, would be nice also to have the, the ability for this to talk directly to the AP and yeah. grab the data off yeah. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and sometimes, uh, what I've noticed uh, with some of the files that we get directly off APs, you'll either have to rename it uh, so the file extension looks right, and then you'll have to make sure that it has the radio tap headers or 802.11 common headers. Okay. But the, the PCAP files should work, yes. So you basically took all the dead air and aggregated it and called it control? Yes. If it's dead air that they reserved. So um, like Andrew Bonangi's post that he had about the iPads and, and re always reserving the maximum amount of time, this would show up a lot in here because they're not necessarily using that time, but they blocked everybody else from using it because they said they were going to use it. And so... It's going to show up in, in the control frames. No, I like it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Although it's going to show up in his control frames, is there any like dancing girls that pop out and say, "Hey, we have a problem"? <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, to an untrained eye, 
they won't know the difference between, let's say, a larger duration versus a smaller right. duration. They just yeah. see pretty colors. Right. Dancing girls are great. <laughs> yeah. right, I make them know that dancing girls. <laughs> Oh, right, dancing girls on the feature request, and then yeah, it just says <laughs> just says dancing girls. Yeah. Yeah. Just comes up from the corner. Um, I think there's an app for that. And right. I thought I just had is you could almost even maybe use a different color for that sort of. This is reserved airtime that wasn't used. I don't yeah. know if you would know yeah. that. You could just like ha leave the same orange and hash it or something. Yeah. yeah. This, this seems yeah. differentiated. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 There was a there was a lot of learning that went on through this entire process um, because we thought we had it all figured out, but uh, tying the acknowledgments to the, the the actual transmitted frame before it was tough because we had to process it and then we had to kind of reprocess it to go back and tie it all again and then we had to reprocess it again to get all the airtime calculations. So there's a, there's a lot that actually happens for us to get this right. Uh, so we, we feel like this is a, a really good um, example of, of, of how uh, you can actually it's a good example of looking at airtime usage of either an SSID or all of the transmitters on a particular channel here. But this example, um, this is, uh, Zerus was at Interop, uh, and I, like, I love showing this example because they had 100 iPads streaming video on a convention floor, and everyone was just like, oh my gosh, how do they do that? Because my Wi-Fi doesn't work. Well, they used 10 SSID, well, 10 BSSIDs on 10 different channels in the 5 gigahertz. And they were all close range, so they could easily talk over anything. Um, they had that 20 dB difference. Uh, but here, uh, this is where Ben Miller uh, originally helped us figure out how to calculate the airtime a little bit better. Um, but you can see some of the, the orange slices are a little bit bigger, and that's because they're reserving more airtime, uh, these, these particular devices here, as compared to other ones. But um, it's important to mention that uh, we calculate the retransmission rate and the airtime and the data rate for each client. So as I go through each of these slices, we can see the total amount of um, bytes sent, packets, and the retransmission rate. So in this example, we see that the one that took up the most airtime had a retransmission rate of 47%. So he's retransmitting and taking up more airtime for every single time he has to retransmit. Um, and in the same, on the same channel, we see some of these actually having lower retransmission rates, down to 19, 16, 17, so, and 11. So they're a little bit more effective. Okay? And if you don't like the order of, uh, the order of this multi-layered pie chart, it respects the, fill, the, the column sorting that you do in the table. So you can sort by retransmission rate and it will resort the entire multi-layered pie chart. And then you can drill down, down to a conversation level. So uh, instead of filtering by MAC address, we're going to show you the entire conversation as it happened because we've reprocessed everything to tie it all into one thing. So when you click on uh, this client MAC address, the Apple device here, we can look at the airtime that was used for this particular conversation and we can investigate each of the subframes. So we see quality of service data, and then we see block acknowledgments, mm -hmm. we see request to send, clear to send, and acknowledgments. Okay? A new feature that was added into IPA is once you have gone down to that level, that conversation, well, at any point, you can actually toggle to the packet view. And this is going to show you the RSSI of every single packet, the subframe type, and the data rate that that packet itself was transmitted at, and the direction that it was going. That's so these awesome. are wow. That's awesome. Yeah, these are all things like that it. really matter to you because, and and it's really going to help for your studies too because you can actually see everything work out the way that it should. For example, when I go down to uh, down to this packet layer, I can see QoS data, data, data. Uh, oh, well, we can see the block acknowledgments. In this in this example, it says ACK. But we'll, we'll see a block acknowledgement after a stream of, of data. Well, the reason you have that is because over on the flag, you got that little circle. It's a retry. Oh, yeah. So that packet was actually resent twice. This is the one that had 47% retry, so we can see frames being retransmitted again and again. Okay. That's very cool. So uh, another, another really cool thing that people miss is we have the view 
uh, in the bottom right hand corner and you can still use it like a multi-layered pie chart here. Uh, if you want to toggle between the, the packets and the bytes, it's very easy to, to toggle that up here at the top. If you notice the, um, the line graph at the top also changes. So we try to keep everything unified. So if I'm viewing in bytes, that's going to appear different with your time graph. If I'm going to show it in, in total packets, it'll change a little bit in total airtime. There. So this time graph actually shows, um, shows the maximum amount of uh, available airtime. So if you see it 100% here, that means no one else was talking. He was able to take up that full amount of space. So you can see the unused space in this entire capture by that particular client, okay? I can actually go back to another level. So this is going to take me, when I click this center piece here, it's going to take me to the full BSSID and all the other clients here. When I click that, it's also going to update all the packets that we see here. Would you call this new view? Packets. packets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It, we're pretty creative. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you notice, I'm, I'm hovering over each of one of these things. And as I just click on them, it'll also update the packets. So instead of having to remember the filters like you do in, uh, Wireshark. in Wireshark or I, I, I get, you know, OmniPeak has, has done a great job of you know, pre-building all the filters and that kind of stuff. But this is really going to help you see the conversations as they occur. Does that work all the way up the tree pie as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if so I go all the way back. just the core. No, it's, it's totally live. So if you hit on any edge, you'll get. Yep, so here yeah. you can see all the beacons of the, of the other networks. We also, uh, we also re remove columns that become redundant. So as you drill down, you're going to see the same PSSID all the way through. So we just remove it. If you want to add it, you can. But as I drill down, you'll see some of these columns disappear, and that's because they've become redundant, and you don't really need to see them anymore. You, you also have more columns than I'm showing now. Um, I like to keep it a little bit simple, but you can have a packet number, your timestamp, your source address, your destination address. All of these are available as columns for you to uh, use. Okay. So... Let's get into some of the really cool stuff because. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the largest button? No. But wait, there's more. But wait. It's nice as it is. You guys see while you're opening this up, I, I gotta applaud you guys for actually taking the time to have Keith come Keith, out yeah. and yeah, teach no. teach the developers about wireless to understand it so that it makes the product useful for us yes. instead yes. of trying to shoehorn something mm -hmm. down onto us that we then have to figure out what were you guys trying to do here and everything. Yeah. It, it's, it seems like, like like what I tweeted, agile companies can do that. The large big names can't. Yeah. It was really enlightening for all of us. Yeah. Um, Thanks, got Keith. really cool offices, too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there weren't any so. flowers, huh? <laughs> um, my mom works for us. She does a lot of QuickBooks and everything, so she sat in. Really? Some was a little over her head, but, but I mean, even <laughs> everyone you know, sat in. I was in everyone was there, and everybody gets it more than they did, and it was yeah, it was really helpful. And as you can tell from, you know, what we're going through now to what we went through last Wireless Field Day, a lot of that came from the training um, that we had with mm -hmm. Keith, just like understanding how the Wi-Fi and the control packets and data packets all this sort of all fits together, and it's it's been very enlightening. So it's a phenomenal. Tool to learn AOH11 now. Yes. 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 That's what I'm seeing. We, we're, we're still working on getting the kind of expert tips built in or the alerts. Mm -hmm. So when, when certain events happen, it kind of helps people you know, say, oh, maybe I should look at that. Uh, I think that, that is something that will come later on. Uh, but we, we still have a lot of really cool things that we have planned for this tool, so stay tuned. OK. So uh, this is an example that I did. Uh, in, in our office environment, and you can see uh, we, we were kind of in a five-story building that has a lot of small, op small offices, so there's a lot of wireless networks. And uh, this is just on one channel, so we see about 28 SSIDs and 542 clients. And uh, what I really wanted to look at in this example was kind of the roaming events. That, that happened, and I'm going to show you the, how we can use the filters in this tool to actually get to those roaming events. So the first thing, uh, 
is the subframe filter bar. So this is what Keith said, I really don't care about the beacons. And you know, our original response to him was, well, you kind of do care about the beacons because if they are using up a lot of airtime and they are transmitting at one megabit per second, they do somewhat matter. And he's like, well, I, once I know that, what's next? So we can actually take those out. So as you go through this list, you can take out the beacons and the probe responses and the probe requests, all of those things that you might see. And you'll notice that the, the airtime graph will actually drop to, to show um, that those, those packets have been excluded. I can take out the QoS, um, all the data frames and all the acknowledgement frames. So you can just go through and uncheck these. And it's going to work in the same way that all of our other filtering works, where uh, it builds the filters going across. So now we're looking at all the reassociation responses, uh, reassociation requests, association, authentication, all these frames that are purple. Okay? And let's say that I only care about MetaGeek related access points or BSSIDs. Well, I can actually apply a filter that says MetaGeek here. And then I'll filter out uh, here where we only see the BSSIDs that are MetaGeek. Okay? And then I can still drill down to any point and see each of the devices that had some sort of roaming event. So this particular one here had a, <coughs> here we see reassociation responses and action frames and authentication frames. Take that to the packet layer here. You can see that happened. And then go back to see all of them per BSSID. So everything is going to respect the filters that we have applied. And as I, um, like if I wanted to bring the data frames back in, just click the X on the filter and then it'll bring the data frames back in. But that, you know, it's, it becomes a problem of, uh, you know, drowning out the useful information. So being able to apply the filters will get you to the, the pieces that you need. Yes? Uh, with the roaming, um, do you have any type of math there that says there was this roam time from one AP to another? No. The, the best you can do is, uh, let me, let me take, up, take the data frames out. I really like that part uh, uh, that Wild Packets was showing, um, showing you know, from the, the last data frame sent to the, to the next Which one. Which is interesting too, right? Because there's different ways of calculating that. Yeah. Whether it be through reassociation yeah. or data. But we can do helpful. a timestamp so you can compare the time here. So you can look at those values at times, but there's no kind of um, difference between those events as of right now. Um, well, what a lot of packet analyzers do is they take the timestamp and they just give you another column of yeah. Yeah. difference delta. between last yeah. the delta yeah. from the last one. Yeah. 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 So then if you had a filter that was just showing you the data packets, you, you'd have one yeah. that had a large gap, yeah. right? Okay. What about even putting it in the gray? Um, here, so you can see the, the difference between the timestamps maybe and the part of the graph. It's part of the graph. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I should mention that you do have the ability, just like uh, with our waterfall navigation, to change your, your time window. Hmm. And this will actually now, um, if I want to view this Apple device over time, I can, I can select that Apple device and then I can move to different points in the capture and it will respect that filter for that device. It, you know, the multi-layered pie chart didn't draw, but... Well, it's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> so this looks like it's a Chuck product, and not really... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, as of right now, yes. Yeah, it, it's more Chuck. It also is um, Bruce. So, <laughs> Bruce... Um, <laughs> We learn all eight of these guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so Bruce is the Wi-Fi guy at an um, enterprise company that has remote access, remote sites. Um, he currently lives in Denver and drives a truck. Um, <laughs> but he, he's the type of guy that you know he has you know six or seven sites, maybe even more that he's managing, and you know he lives in Denver, but he's got that site in Boulder that he doesn't necessarily want to drive there, so he can like remote in or whatever he's trying to do. Um, but still fairly Wi-Fi savvy. So it's kind of for him too, but definitely you know. We're trying to figure out how can we get some of this Wi-Fi learning 
not dumb it down, but how do you simplify it? And I think the expert tips and stuff, kind of in Dancing Girls, would help for those. <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? The, the, the alerts of, of in, in the tools <coughs> will help those guys. But yeah, right now it's, it's kind well, of an expert tool. A lot of those tool. are ratio based mm -hmm. and come up with some visualization. Yeah. This is great to visualize what you have, but how do you then take when it, when it hits some threshold, <coughs> it now is a different something. Yeah. yeah. The dancing girls pop out or they yeah. start to wiggle or something. Yeah. I'm going to have to trademark that. <laughs> Can't use Too late. Tomorrow. Echo has it. <laughs> Dancing girl Disney. feature request. That's right. Rack mounted go go girls. Are there any questions about this piece as of right now? You said this is beta? No. This, this is, is out. This is released. This is released. This is released. So some of you should already have a license. That license should be good, unless our developers have hijacked it um, and used it for their own. Sorry, Blake. Um, That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. We cool, bro? Yeah. yeah. So like cool, two bro. days ago, Blake emailed us. He's like, hey, you know, I haven't installed one machine, but I want to install, install a second machine. Can I do that? My license isn't working. And we're like, well, it, it should work up to five machines. I don't know why it's not working. So. Our guy went into the to the license server database, and apparently it was licensed that half of our developers have been using too. <laughs> so, <laughs> we got that fixed. Um, now it's probably a good time to hand out bags. Sure. Um, we have goodies for you guys, as usual. So this year, we have um, little bags with MetaGeek. Um, and it's got little pockets on the side and bigger pockets. Nice. Nice. So, and nice. Jennifer, you might have seen this bag. It actually is from a camera backpack. This is this little <laughs> bag that comes with it. One of our guys had the backpack, and we're like, that is the coolest little bag. So we like emailed the, the backpack company and got these as sort of like replacement parts. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which company was it? Um, I don't know. I think it's low pro. Hold me at the screen and we can tell. Pass them down. Oh. Uh, we'll just pass them down. You want to grab some chat? Sure. So some of you guys already have gadgets. If you do, you know, here's some extras. You. If you don't. And in that is um, a little piece of paper that has license keys for Chanzer Pro and IPA. Thanks, brother. Did we get enough? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is this small yeah. 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 Uh, I, I just have a few more things to point out on this, if you don't mind. Uh, <coughs> they're, they're busy now, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll take your time. Yeah, it fits in. Oh, I got one just like that. Yeah. We call it the blade. The blade antenna. The one, the one that's hard, I've got the 900. And I've got the one of the little cases that Keith uses. Oh, um, and the antenna's like that one. Yeah, and the antenna's massive <laughs> because it's so low. Yeah. 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 yeah, we had some people ask us, like, you know, are you like directional antenna for 900? And we're like, we it's could, massive. but you gotta be like this yeah. big. <laughs> so. Oh, that's awesome. This one, right? Yeah. <laughs> So if any of you guys ran it in the beginning and haven't used it since, uh, we've, incre we've increased the processing time significantly. And part of that was because in this example, there are 604,000 packets that I captured in this room. And if any of you have done packet analysis before, you see a lot of packets and they can you know, make things run significantly slower. Well, when we were drawing um, the multi-layer pie charts, we were drawing 604,000 slices, or you know, depending on the conversations. But we just had a lot of slices that were not visible to the human eye, even if you had retina. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, what we started doing was we actually started uh, kind of bucketing all of the extra, extra frames into kind of a, a gray area. So when you see kind of empty slices here, 
called miscellaneous. That's where those are. And most of the time, I'm going to guess, you know, 98% uh, of the time, obviously, look at the multi-layer pie chart. Um, you're not going to see any of these, but you still can get to them if you need to. So if you have a question about this Cisco system uh, SSID, you can double click on that and that will still take you to, um, well, I thought it would. Oh, yes. It'll still take you to those frames. So you haven't lost anything in the, in the, in the packet capture. Um, it's, just, it's just one of those things to make the application faster for everyone. We took the, the stuff that you may not notice as much, um, put them into kind of a miscellaneous uh, slice in the multi-layered pie chart. And with that, we also did a lot of improvements on the back end for performance. And just like we talked about before, a tool like Wireshark is one pass on the packets. It says, this packet is a data packet, next packet. And it doesn't do a lot to, to kind of follow the conversation. We have to do a three pass on it to really get the conversation all built up and who was talking to who and why. Mm -hmm. And so those 604,000 packets, we have to go through the packet list three times to really figure out the conversation. Right. And the version that we first released was really slow. <coughs> And so we did a lot of work in the back end to, to improve that so you can actually use the tool at a, at a reasonable yeah. pace. So in other words, that's where a retina Mac would help. Hmm? That's where a retina Mac would help. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> <laughs> With a quad core i7. It's so much faster, too. Yeah. I mean, you just mouse over and it's just happening. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's been a lot of work done in the back end. You know, there may not be a lot of features that stand out that are, you know, big improvements, but as far as using an application, I feel like it's so easy to kind of go to any any piece and say, okay, what is that? Let me look at it. And even without drilling down, I know exactly the stats that I care about for that device. I, I can say that Apple device had an effective data rate of 52.4 megabits per second and a retry rate of 29%. And it used up that much of the total packets or, in, in this case, that much of the airtime here. So. Um, we didn't talk about the, the shades of green. Um, Are there 50? That's 50, <laughs> shades of green. 50 shades of green. Uh, the, uh, the shades, the darker the color is, represents the, fa the faster the data rate. So from, from a high level, you can actually see um, the, the devices that we're able to talk quicker. Is there any uh, plans to integrate the spectrum piece to this? That is a good question. We'll talk um, about that off camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, the filter framework still works the same. If I want to see anything that is uh, not AT&T Wi-Fi, I can type in AT&T Wi-Fi here and exclude it. I used to be able to type in Apple, and it would show me all the Apple devices, but they, they removed that. Um, the so vendor's not working. Oh, did not apply it? Well, you can only do, um, if you click the negative one and type in AT&T Wi-Fi, it'll crash the application. <laughs> Just process it. Okay. Thank you. You guys didn't have to see the dance this year. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have filtered out AT&T Wi-Fi. So if you see something that you want out, you can take it out. Or you can say, I only want to see, see AT&T Wi-Fi. It's the same filter framework that is uh, in Insider. So if you're used to Insider and you're used to Channelizer, it's going to be very similar in IPA. Any questions? Cool. What is your recommendation at this point for integrating the content here into the reporting functions of Channelizer? Oh, good question. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a lot right now. But we do have export to CSV uh, right here. And that takes the table here and it exports it to a CSV. So if you want to take that data and just paste it into a report block in Channelizer Pro, you can do that. Or you can take a screenshot um, at any level and import that as an image into uh, Channelizer Pro. Uh, this is pretty cool because if you have a network and you want to show someone the, the clients for that SSID, once I click on it, now this table has changed to show all the clients, the total amount of airtime that they have sent, 
the total amount of bytes, total amount of packets, and their retransmission rate. I can export that table as a CSV and use it for whatever kind of reporting needs I, I, I need to do. So, to recap, do you do remote capture to anyone's ATs now? No. And, and, you know, to any vendors listening, if you guys want that to happen, talk to us. Yeah. Currently, the only direct capture we have is from the ERP cap. Um, but we definitely are, are planning to expand that out. 